I got that for seven hundred and fifty dollars twenty years ago. So don't put it in our pockets. <laughs> that uh, I, I I I can only Pango guess Con, what that 2015. Cost today, but that Asteroids, so near wrong. Earth because objects, and meteorites. Twenty years ago, meteorites were just starting to get popular. Now they're just going crazy. And the U.S. government actually, uh, the uh, Department of the Interior now has changed the rules on meteorites. If you happen to find a meteorite on U.S. land, you must, and you sell it, you must give a portion to the U.S. government. I'm like, wow. Even if you're on property? I think it has to be U.S. like, like forest land. Like forest land, land or U.S. Park land. land. Yeah. Yeah, I was able to please to hear that. <laughs> so yeah, I'm a, I'm on, I'm on uh, uh, social media like crazy. So uh, you guys can follow me. I've been tweeting, tweeting oh, stuff right here. Goodness. What's the one on the far left? Uh, that's a world. It's a hell with a www that you can't really read. So I gotta oh. fix that. But yeah, I'm on the, I'm on the web too. I got a website. Pal, so this, is, this is a meter. This one here that, that is from Campo de Cilio. That is, uh, where's the, this is, there, it's from the same fault. You cut that in half, it look like this on the inside. It's very, very cool. And I'll pass this one around. This looks, this way. Yeah, this is a, this is a stony with flecks of metal in it. This would have come from the crust of, of an asteroid. That one, this is a come, it's, 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 it's solid piece of nickel iron. Yes, it's probably 95% nickel, or iron, 5%. Nickel and uh, these. Uh, but did anybody else not get this? I mean, so many people just came in. Yeah. So the same one you passed over. Yeah. Right. Okay. I don't know. It's not outreach. It didn't. It's not crystallized. Um, Students' hands. Sure. Looks like whatever their environment is in. It got quenched. That was. I'll be going over that. But this is in 2013. The asteroid that fell over Russia that shattered all the glass. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm suspecting it's the glass. I can't guarantee it, but I, I, I trust my dealer. But, okay, let's. Got one minute. So, how do you identify a meteorite if you find one? That is tough because if they're, uh, if they're stony, and you don't find them quick, they just start looking like earth rocks. If they're iron and you don't find them quick, they rust. Right. And uh, you can actually, uh, I've had lots of people send me pictures of them, and I'm like, uh, you know, you, you're, the best way, the, the only true way to do it is to slice them and kind of chemically analyze them. Okay. But if you slice them and you see this kind of pattern, yeah. you're guaranteed to have a meteorite. Because yeah. this kind of pattern does not form on earthbound, earthbound rocks. So a magnet is not a good indicator. Nope, nope. Uh, you know they are. They a lot of them can be ferromagnetic. The most common falls are the stonies, though, not the irons, which is a misconception a lot of people, which I'll also cover here. But anyway, let's get started here. Uh, I am uh, Bob Tremblay. I've been an amateur astronomer and living in the area here uh, since 1968. Uh, I'm a board member of the Warren Astronomical Society. They're a very active astronomy club. I love, I, love, I love the group. I've been in there for three years now. I, I edit their newsletter, and I am uh, uh, forming an education special interest group because I, I found that uh, uh, most people's knowledge of astronomy, not necessarily this group, but most people, is abysmally low. And I'm going to fix that. So I, uh, I'm an avid fan of science fiction. I have been for years and years. I'm a volunteer NASA GPL Solar System Ambassador. This is a program where uh, they, they, they find folks that do a lot of outreach and uh, they, they recruit us to, uh, to help them out. And uh, I get to sit in on teleconferences with NASA folk and get the latest scoop on things that are going on and I have to do stuff like this, which is awesome. And my wife just became a solar system ambassador and another buddy from, oh, another buddy from the Warren Astronomical Society did just recently. Dan Burton. There's a whole bunch of solar system ambassadors all over the region, and every one of us would just love to come and talk in your classroom. Um, I'm a solar observing enthusiast. That's uh, me with my solar telescope and my big scope, and it's me in my wife's classroom talking about the sun. A bunch of kids. That was hilarious. I'm also just recently started uh, writing astronomy and space science articles for Brother Guy's website, which I created for him 
Well, that, that's been awesome, directly way I've been wanting to go. So I am, uh, since I'm fascinated by asteroids, you know, I'm fanatically interested in asteroids. Can you go back to the, is that actually a priest on the part of the brother guy? Bro no, brother guy, he's a Jesuit brother. Uh, the second guy is definitely a priest. He's okay. a brother guy, was born and raised in the Detroit area here. Uh, uh, went to Cranbrook, got his PhD, I believe, at MIT. He's been curator of meteorites at the Vatican Observatory for like 30 years. He just gave that up, and he is now the president of the Vatican Observatory Foundation. And he, he says, mostly what I'm doing now is fundraising, because they, they raise funds to uh, maintain uh, the Vatican's telescope in uh, Arizona. They have a, a, a huge telescope down there. They do a lot of uh, education and stuff. It's pretty cool. Getting to hobnob with, with, real, with real astronomers. So uh, uh, one week ago, um, this thing was discovered. And uh, it flew by Earth uh, a couple days ago, and it was six to six to twenty meters. And so it, it this was this is happening all the time. Things being discovered and flying by a few days later. And this happened in February of 2013. There was a very well publicized flyby of an asteroid. This thing was uh, going to fly by. It was all over the news. Going to be safe. Won't hit us. And uh, people were watching it as it flew by. There's its orbit, kind of Earth-like, slightly uh, off plane of the ecliptic. Uh, passing by the Earth, it, it flew inside the geosynchronous uh, uh, circle. And uh, it, the gravity of the Earth actually changed this thing's orbit. And that, happened, that can happen quite a bit. If, if, an, if an asteroid gets too close to a, a planetary body, its orbit can change. But meanwhile, on the same day, Something that wasn't told that shouldn't hit us, hit us. This thing uh, blew up over Chelyabinsk, and there, there was uh, all these dash cams in Russia, and they caught it at several different angles, and they were able to go back and figure out its direction. But this thing, um, entered the atmosphere uh, almost 20 kilometers per second, and uh, yeah, it uh, blew up at 29 kilometers up. It was technically a bolide, I'll, I'll get to that later. And it had an enormous amount of energy, 27 times the Hiroshima bomb, 90 kilotons was just irradiated energy out from it. I love that picture too, That's a, that, that guy timed that shot just, just huh. beautifully. So it left an awesome looking contrail, you see time exposures, it just roiling, everybody went up to their windows to gawk at it. And, uh, that was the problem, because they couldn't see the shock wave heading towards them. So three minutes later, the shock wave hit. It blew people away from windows and stuff. It blew in the sides of buildings and doors. It actually collapsed the top of a zinc plant. And 1,600 people were injured mainly doing flying glass. There were no deaths. We were really lucky. There's an O, um, it came in and uh, directly below it, it blew people off their feet. Some people reported sunburns and some people reported pain in their eyes because it was really bright. And I can imagine a lot of stress. This is an overpressure map I got from Bill Higgins actually. Um, this, is, this shows uh, where glass was blown out over Chelyabinsk and uh, the final destination was in Chortable Lake right there. Found that the same day, and you know, people they were saying it was probably not related. Well, yeah, it was. And eventually, a few months later, they pulled that out. And wow. This thing, um, this thing weighed so much it broke the scale. They were trying to weigh it out, and uh, so it was the largest event since Tunguska. How many of you have heard of Tunguska? I'm just going to ask. Oh, that. thank you. I was in a panel a couple of years ago. I asked that question. Nobody raised their hand. I have it in here. So uh, NASA, NASA found out about it on Twitter, as did I. I had an insomnia that day. Woke up at 4.30, got on Twitter, and I'm like, what? We got hit? I woke my wife up. I'm like, we got hit! We got hit! And she's like, yeah, that's nice. Leave me alone. <laughs> so I get, I get asked all the time, you know, why didn't we see this thing coming? Well, it was dark. It was very dark. It was pretty tiny, not much bigger than like a U-Haul. And it came from sunward. And you don't have anything looking in that direction, right? Here's an example, and this gives you a, uh, 
a size description. No, nobody nobody remembers the one that passed by and didn't hit. Everybody remembers the one that hit. But yeah, see, it's, it's uh, oh, not that big. But uh, so I'm sorry. In that example, which one's which? Which one hit? The smaller the one is okay. that's 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 the jelly beans one. That's the one that blew up. That's the one that flew by. Okay. So the one that flew by, if that had hit. They came from opposite directions. Yes, I actually have a picture. People were wondering if they were related to the same family. Right. Uh, no, they weren't. So there's some photos of it. And what they did was, some scientists went back, and since they had all these dash cam images all over the place, they went to the exact position where these images were taken, and they were able to calculate the orbit of the meteoroid, and they calculated it to be comfortably right out past Mars in the asteroid belt. Now here's where here's where the two the, the DA14 and uh, they're the totally different angles. They they came from they're they're not related at all. They came they came from wildly different angles. And then there's this guy. Has to be one of them, right? So, so when I when I when I'm talking about some of the other uh, uh, impacts here, I, I'm wondering if those were weapons as well. But. So this is, these pieces people were retrieving, they, they found these in holes in the snow and everything. The one that I passed around there is about the size of the one circled here. And there, there it is. And Tunguska, in 1908, um, in Russia, in the middle of nowhere, uh, I love this, the sky split in two and fire appeared high and wide over the forest. <laughs> well, that, that's an artist rendition of what it looked like. and. Uh, does that look at all familiar? Probably looked exactly the same as Jelly Advance. Shockwave broke windows hundreds of kilometers away. It registered as a 5.0 on the Richter scale. And the first expedition took more than a decade to get there. And when they got there, they did not find an impact crater. They found this flattened trees in a gigantic area. Um, uh, flattened in a radial pattern out from uh, ground zero, and the area is actually larger than Washington, D.C. So, yikes. And this is a beautiful picture of probably what happened. It was an air burst, and you can see the, uh, the reflection underneath it is what flattened the tree. And the trees directly at ground zero were still standing straight up with all their limbs ripped off. Hold on. I know this is an artist representation, but is that well, shot on what did? Thank you. Uh, is that shot at the very bottom curving up or curving Yeah, it's just re it's reflecting and moving across the surface. So it, it's hitting the ground and reflecting. And oh, it's okay. Expanding out. So oh, okay. well, that, that, that Don Dixon, Don Davis painting things we love that. So I, I took a blast pattern and I overlaid it a Google map of Detroit. Uh -huh. And that is a <laughs> yikes. And I made sure that where I live is just up there. <laughs> so, where do these things come from? Well, let's do some story time. So, yeah, I get a laugh at that sometimes. Some people know that. So, a long time ago, in one of these uh, star, numerous star-forming nebula within our galaxy, um, a cloud of gas and dust started to condense. I gotta get that out of shirt. I love that. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> these things are called proplids, and these are uh, proplids in the Orion Nebula. Um, the, 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 this gas and dust and things that you see out there, it's mostly hydrogen, a lot of helium, and there's other elements, like, and dust. Now, I've only put a few examples of the dust, but this list would go down through the floor of, of stuff that's out there. There's a lot of stuff in these clouds. Now this is pretty interesting, and there's 42 atoms in these clouds that have two Two uh, 42 elements, 42 molecules that have two atoms, and and, and, and there's so you see there's a lot of different elements in here, and you recognize a lot of these. There's a huge list. Now the interesting thing about it is that they found organic molecules in these interstellar clouds, including glycine. They have found the simplest of the amino acids there, and uh, they have found glycine in meteorites, comet tail dust that they return. They, they found it spectroscopically in these clouds, and uh, it's pretty much all over the place when these things form. So these clouds, they, commit, they begin to condense, and they start to spin, and um, the center starts to get really, really hot. This is called a protoplanetary or accretion disk. Here's an example of a whole bunch of them. That's 
of this winter. Oh, that's a new warming star in the planetary system right there. So temperature, pressure in the core starts to heat up. Uh, eventually it gets so hot that, that fusion is ignited. And boom, you got a new star. And here's an example of that, exactly that. New stars have, generally new stars will have these, these jets coming out of them. And you can see, the, uh, you can still see the disk around that star there. So material in, in close to the star uh, starts to clump together and planetesimals will start to form. And, and some of the stuff that's really close will get so hot it will melt. And uh, here, here's an example of some, some dust. This is the stuff that these things form out of. And I read, and initially they're going to just loosely form into like what's called a rubble pile and slowly get larger. And as they do get larger, their gravity starts to pull more stuff in. But further out from the star, the volatiles aren't blown away. Like out past the asteroid where the asteroid belt is now, um, it's not hot enough to, 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 to you know, vaporize these things. So they remain frozen. And this is where you get comets. So the in, back in the inner system, the uh, protoplanets start to grow. The gravity gets really big. And bombardments and mergers, these are going to be happening all the time. Um, planets are going to be, early protoplanets are going to be molten <laughs> spheres. Yeah, they're, it's going to be a mess. Uh, this planet, this, this process is called accretion. And here's, here's a, a, an artist's rendition of it, of a protoplanet in the disk, pulling material off from either side. And uh, the thing is, is this material that it pulls off, you know, it can be, these lumps can be pretty darn big, and they don't always you know, impact. Sometimes they can get flung into crazy orbits. Close, close passes can rip these things apart and uh, just, just cause a mess. So eventually, the planets, uh, planet's gravity is going to clear their orbits of stuff. Solar wind is going to push gases away, and that gas is going to carry the dust with it, and you'll have a system like we have now. But not all that stuff has been cleared away. This is a this is a fresh impact fresh impact crater from like 2012 that the uh, high rise experiment uh, witnessed on Mars, and there's actually a newer one than this. And they've also we've also seen these on the Moon. There's a whole program for recording lunar impacts, which also, is really cool. Uh, please, I thought the message of one in Mercury is going to be. The messenger mission is due to impact Mercury on the 30th. It, like this morning, had its last boost up, and uh, that's pretty much it. And yeah, but I, you know, and then follow up later on in uh, 2017, we're going to look at that with another probe. Oh, really? I hadn't heard about that. <coughs> I have to look that, look that up. up. Uh, yeah. Uh, they, they, want to, they want to see at least because on the dark side of the planet. Um, how at least I think the last pattern is the crater um, forms. And they want to, since it's a new, uh, they want to use that as a template to see, um, I guess, crater formation. So don't focus on everything. I, I, I didn't hear about that. Yeah. Okay. I was really distressed to hear the message was ending. It was, all, it was kind of sad to me. Like, it is. I knew it was going to be eventually, but like, like end of this month. Yikes. So anyway, talking about craters, uh, impact craters, we see them everywhere in the solar system. And it will accept, well, we, see, we do see them on Earth, but a lot of them get wiped away due to uh, the environment and uh, weathering and stuff like that. But they are everywhere from Mars all the way out to, well, we're expecting to see them on Pluto. But there are a lot of them on the Earth, too, and some of them are really beautiful. So this whole process is called, the, it was originally called the nebular hypothesis, and it went through a long evolution. It changed. They are having issues with the angular momentum. It was abandoned. It was brought back. And eventually, today, we call this the solar nebular uh, disk model, and it's pretty much been supported by a giant space telescopes seeing this kind of stuff. So returning to the protoplanets near the solar system, um, differentiation is a process that happens when, is when these things start to get big enough they will become round under their own gravity. Their own gravity. They will. <clears throat> these things. Uh, there's a structural integrity about them, and when you get to a certain point, the gravitational force of the body will overcome the structural integrity, and the thing will just <laughs> right into a sphere. Well, it probably won't be that fast. Now, if it gets big enough, what can happen is the heavier stuff can start sinking to the middle, and uh, the lighter stuff starts floating up. And this, this will cause something called igneous processing. It's, it's chemical processing. The nature of the metals and the material of the planetary body will start to change. So if you have 
uh, a differentiated body smack into, well, non differentiated, well, it doesn't matter, smack into another body. These things can break up. And you can have bits of core material mixed in with bits of mantle, mixed in with bits of crust. You can have them flung off all over the place. And uh, you can, they can even reaccrete. Like, like, like with this thing, this thing right here is an example of something that would be of reaccreted. So originally it would have differentiated, stuff would have sunk and, and floated and stuff like that. And then it got smashed and then it formed back together. It might differentiate again, it might not. Who knows? So let's go through some terminology and I'll be quick. Um, a meteorite, this is a small body um, from microns, microscopic to one meter. There are countless trillions of these orbiting, orbiting the sun. A meteor is one of one of these incinerates in the atmosphere. And what happens is uh, the friction on the front of these things uh, causes a plasma, it causes the air to turn into a plasma, and that's the bright streak that you see. And uh, most meteorites, meteoroid, meteoroid material, uh, disintegrates in the atmosphere before it hits the Earth. A fireball is an exceptionally bright version of one of these. The International Astronomical Union says brighter than any planets. And uh, this, is, this is a great example of a uh, fireball in 1972. Actually, one of the guys uh, who's seen this lecture before said he actually witnessed this, which is pretty cool. I don't know if you can see it there. Yeah, there it is. Right in the daytime, it, went, it took that path and it went right out of the atmosphere, so we just skipped right in and out. I think I remember that. It was like daylight for yep. in the evening. Yeah, that was really cool. Bolide is a fireball that explodes, and uh, the Chelyabinsk uh, impact was essentially a bolide, but nobody called it that. Meteorite is one of these things that makes it to the ground. This is my lovely wife uh, sitting next to one that I really want to have. But uh, this is the Field Museum in, uh, in Chicago. That's really cool. An asteroid is anything from a meter to hundreds of kilometers in size. They can be Iron, they can be rubble piles, they can be wimpy comet fluff balls. Um, they've, they've also been called planetoids, and these are definitely remnants of the solar system. This one right here is Aikatawa, and you can see this looks like a rubble pile. This is just a, it's a pile of rubble floating in space. It's actually probably two that uh, impacted together. You get one there and one there. That's cheap. Probably a low, a low velocity impact is at a different angle. It actually looks like there's a splash pattern on one side, too. It's really cool. So a comet, yeah, these are dark, icy dirt balls. And uh, what these things do is that, you know, they've got the volatile materials. They, they might have a rocky core, but there's a lot of ices in here. And these things, as they go around the sun, they start to outgas. Um, and the stuff flows off it and then creating these really cool tails. Well, if they keep doing that around, they go around and around and around. Eventually, over the course of millions of years, they're going to run out of volatiles, or the heat's not going to heat up deep enough to get the volatiles to come off. So, you know, what do you call a comet that's lost all its volatiles? Well, an asteroid. They are related. So there are some asteroids out there which, again, they're, they're wimpy ex-comets. These things are probably, you've had icy stuff in here, blowing off, leaving pits and stuff. These are probably not very, they're very porous. A near-Earth object is an, an object that is in proximity to the Earth, and these can be asteroids, they can be comets, and they can also be spacecraft bits, and there are a lot of those out there. Potentially hazardous asteroid is one that can come close enough to the Earth and large enough to cause significant damage. Meteor showers, uh, when a comet goes around uh, the sun, it will leave a trail. That all, all that tail material doesn't just go away. It follows the comet in the orbit, and this will create rivers, essentially, of this stuff around the sun. And if the Earth plows through one of those, that's where you get your meteor showers from. That's why they're so predictable every year. So iron meteorites, these guys are, uh, are actually pretty rare. This is uh, the lowest percentage of the fall, about 5%. They're iron-nickel alloy. And uh, they resemble the outer core of the Earth. Uh, this pattern you saw in that one I passed around, that's called, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, a Widmestatin pattern. This is a crystallization of the metal that forms this very distinct pattern. And when you, when you slice a meteorite, you'll, uh, an iron meteorite, sometimes you'll get these, sometimes not. I've actually seen one that was, that was sliced and it was absolutely silvery clear. It was beautiful. 
but uh, you, a lot of times you'll have this pattern in, in an iron one. Chondrites, these are stonies. These are the most abundant, and these are also, if you, if you don't find them soon after fall, you might not find them because uh, <laughs> they'll, they'll just start to degrade and, and look like earth stuff. They can, they can have metal and nickel in them and, uh, and other materials. Um, Chelyabins was one of these stonies. It was not an iron. It was, it was a stony. There wasn't a whole lot left of it. You see, it started, it started off as the size of a U-Haul and went down to something like that. So yeah, a lot of it burnt off. Chondrites are a form of a stony meteorite that have these things in them called chondrules. And these are little melty bits that uh, formed before the meteorite accreted or the asteroidal bit accreted. And they, they contain olivine and pyroxene, and, and these can be really beautiful. Um, an achondrite is essentially one that, that didn't have the melty bits in them. And again, these are these are low percentage. Stony iron, these are gorgeous, and these, these would have come from like the, the mantle of a, a differentiated body. You're going to have bits of igneous processed uh, material in there, and you're going to have bits of iron and, and the nickel in there. And they can be really pretty. I've got, I've got a piece of this here. There's, there's a really big example of it. I can't even imagine how much that piece would be worth. Yikes. Um, HED meteorites, so these, these would have come from Vesta. Uh, they're, they're very, again, very rare. These would have come from the asteroid Vesta. And SNC types would have come from the surface of Mars. Cover up the fusion crust. I mentioned this before. Now, when, when these things hit the atmosphere and you get this plasma really hot forming in front of them, it can cause material to melt and flow. And you can see this thing on the right here. You can see the flow patterns going on from this. This one probably came in rotating like that. Um, a lot of times they'll just do a 3D tumble and melt all over the place. But it'll just form a fusion crust. It can be black, brown, or greeny, and a couple millimeters thick. And uh, they, pretty much, they pretty much all have these. Now when these things blow up in the atmosphere, the stony ones, they, they'll, they'll blow up coming down and they'll, they'll land in what's called a strewn pattern, which is generally an ovaloid pattern that you will, you will find all these things in. And uh, meteorites that were observed, well, meteorites collected after the fall, and then right now, yeah, meteorites collected after, the not observed are called finds. Meteorites that you collect after a fall, they're called a fall, so there's a slight difference there. But, so meteorite, meteoroid or asteroid orbits, here's, here's one that's in a very Earth-like orbit. It is, it's almost on the plane of the ecliptic and very similar to the Earth. They don't always have to do that. They can be like that, they can be on the plane of the ecliptic a little bit off, way out on the asteroid belt, or they can just go way out of the plane of the ecliptic. They can go all over the place. Here's an example of a whole bunch. This, these were uh, orbits of fireballs that hit the Earth on uh, September 10th of 2013. They calculated the uh, orbits of all these. And you can see the orbits of these, they're just all over the place. So uh, there's different names for different types of asteroids. Um, you'll have, you can, you, they can orbit completely outside the Earth, completely inside the Earth. The ones we got to worry about are the ones that cross the Earth's orbit on the corners there. Um, well, this is pretty interesting. This was uh, they thought this was an asteroid, but they found out it was actually uh, an Apollo, uh, uh, a second stage, a third stage from the Apollo. Now, think about an asteroid doing this. You can't even calculate this orbit. The, the, the gravity of the Earth and the Moon are causing this thing to go all over the place. It be the same with an asteroid. This is a little lighter, though, but still. So this, this nearly hit the Earth several times. And then the last time it loops around here, the, it, the moon's gravity yanks it, and it uh, loops right out and away. And there you go. So that is insane. Think about stuff doing like this all the time around here. Doesn't that have an Earth that revolves around the sun? I mean, after you know, if you map it out for years, don't we go in an elliptical orbit? Yeah, we, we, we precess what you're saying. Yeah, but yeah, we do a little. So there's the main asteroid belt, and uh, the orbit, that, that large circle on the outside is the orbit of Jupiter. Now notice how far the asteroids are away from Jupiter. That's because Jupiter's gravity is hellacious. 
There's a side view of the asteroid belt, a little thicker than you might have expected. And uh, up by Jupiter, Jupiter, its gravity is so big, it, it, has, a, it has a weird effect. Let me bring that back up. You'll have a group of asteroids here, here, and here. And these guys follow Jupiter, well, these, these precede Jupiter, 60 degrees behind, and these guys, uh, the uh,